guys, this week I got to hang out with two of my favourite writerly people, the lovely Max Porter who wrote Grief is a Thing with Feathers and the lovely Sarah Moss who wrote The Tidal Zone. Both of these are books that I have raved about a lot on this channel. I'll leave links to my reviews down below and link to a podcast that I've recorded with Max before as well. So I went to the London Review Bookshop to meet up with both of them and some of the other members of the Grant team. I had a chat with Sarah Moss and we recorded that and then Sarah and Max went upstairs to give a talk at London Review Bookshop to lots of customers who'd come to listen to them chat about books and writerly things. So this is what this video is going to be. It's going to be the footage of me chatting to Sarah and then I'm going to include some of the footage of Max and Sarah's events as well because Max as well as being a writer is senior editor at Granta and he is Sarah's editor so it's just really lovely to listen to them chat about bookish things. I hope you enjoy the video, go buy both of the books, they are brilliant. Sarah is looking for the women so that we can have them face yes. out in the background. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Well done. <laughs> so if you were gonna describe this book to someone who hasn't read it, what's your elevator pitch? It's about a family establishing the new normal in the wake of the critical illness of a teenager. Very nice, very succinct. I like it. It's quite well rehearsed. Quite yes, nice. I was going to say, how many times have you been asked that? And you're like, I really need to sound excited about my book still, but I'm really not anymore. I love so many things about this book, and there are so many threads that run through it. But I think I, what I particularly love in all of your books are the voices of the children. Thank you. Because they are fantastic. Kids say the best things anyway, don't yes. they? Yes. You have two boys of your own. What is the most ridiculous, or some of the most ridiculous things that they've ever said? Oh, there's a long list. Um, a recent one was, try I was trying to get Andrew doing a jigsaw puzzle so mm. that I could go check my work email and my son sighed heavily and said, well, mummy, I suppose we all have our duties in life and that seems to be yours. <laughs> my favourite thing that a child ever said to me was in the bookshop that I used to work at and it was about, she was about eight mm. and she said to me, I'm, I'm going to be an author when I grow up. I've written a book. And I said, oh, have you? What's it about? And she said, I don't know. It's in my head. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> and I just thought that was brilliant. I know brilliant. that feeling. Yeah. yeah, I know that feeling too. So what themes did you want to bring into this book? How did you go about writing it? Which thing came first for you? The first thing was Adam's voice. Okay. Uh, the first thing for me is always a voice. And then there was Coventry Cathedral and then there was this, yes, a sense that the world wasn't safe or mm. that it ceased to be safe mm -hmm. and that even in the times and places where we think we're safe I mean for all our terror at the moment actually living in Northern Europe in the early 21st century is still about as safe as it gets in yep. human experience Absolutely. and it's still terrifying Do you know what you're writing next? Are you working on something right now? It's at, it's at exactly the stage that your 8 year old Describe. Oh, it's, it's in your head and you can't talk about it yet. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of taking shape, but I don't quite know what shape. Yeah. Is it going to be related to any of your other novels or is it going to be a standalone? I don't know. Characters do seem to pop up again. They do? I like them. Yeah. It's quite fun. Mm. No. I don't think it's going to be a sequel of any kind. Okay. But there might, yeah, you might meet someone you know. That's exciting. Sarah and I, 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 I hope that we have a good relationship. I think we have a good relationship. <laughs> It's going well. <laughs> Is it going well? Yeah. <laughs> I feel for Miriam in ways I haven't rarely felt about characters in fiction. Mainly that I wished I had a mobile number <laughs> so that I could just occasionally text something. And sometimes it would just be, be a bit nicer to your dad. Adam's challenge, Adam's philosophical game, if you like, in this book is how to relate this pain, this shock that they have experienced in their family, which actually is okay, his daughter of Miriam is alive, with the pain of the world, mm -hmm. which he is hearing on the news, he's engaging yeah. with. Adam is a kind man. I think yes. ultimately that's the point of him as yes. a character, right? He's a good bloke. Yeah. Why, why, why did you go about that? Is that because in some respects that's the challenge of our, yes. of our time? Yes. Um, there are, well, there are two answers to that, really. Um, I think one of the things that's, that's really hard about living here and now, and as I say that, I think it's ridiculous to say this is hard because it would be much harder to do it any other way, but it's our constant knowledge about what's happening in the world 
and the need to reconcile that somehow with our own very safe and pleasant and comfortable lives and how to do that in a way that doesn't silence either of those narratives and while I was writing this book um, we, we always have a literary date program on in the mornings and I was listening to it and there was a report from a bombed city in Syria and a man standing in the ruins shouting where is the world, where is the world while this is happening and I remember the translator translating it very flatly without, without the emotion and I kind of froze making the packed lunches in my kitchen thinking here here, he, you know, we, we hear you. The BBC has brought you here. I can hear you, but I have no idea what to do. I, I have no, you know, the fact of my hearing is useless, completely useless, and I have no idea what I might be able to do that would show that I've heard or that my hearing has made any difference at all to anything at all. Adults seem to shut something off and carry on. Yes. One of the times in life when you refuse to let that outrage stop burning is when you're a teenager. Yes. And one of the questions teenagers ask their parents is, how the can you live yeah. with this? And I don't want my packed lunch, thank you. And I don't yeah. care about these salty crisps. Yeah. I mean, Adam is, uh, you know, and I, had, I in fact attacked you on this during the process. <laughs> They're ridiculous about not letting the kids eat chocolate and sweets and everything. And I, and I was like, God, I'm a bad parent. I just let my kids eat anything. <laughs> Um, and yet I'm still making them like, listen, listen to this on Radio 4, it's important you hear this. And they're like, quite rightly, Dad, I'm three. Give me some time to use, you know. Maybe, maybe stop eating so much sugary stuff first and we'll deal with the atrocities of the world later. But Miriam is an extraordinary creation because she is exactly at that moment. Yes. She's had this thing happen to her. The last thing she's going to do is, is, is admit to being frightened or scared. Yeah. So she puts all this fear, combined with what you have to say, she's an, she's an unusual character and that she's exceptionally intelligent. Yeah. And some of that is based in your life because you have exceptionally intelligent kids. <laughs> who, like, who would just come in here and be like, dink, 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 read it, read it, read it, read it. They're brilliant. But let's talk about Miriam because she is, she is very, very angry. She's very, very clever. She sees in Adam this sort of sparring partner. Yeah. He engages and then doesn't because he recognises he's got to let her be herself. Yes. And it's a sort of dance they're doing yes. around this silent fear that yes. this might happen again, that yes. life is always... I mean, you, you don't have a teenage daughter. No. Did you go to your own story? Did you... There's probably a bit of me. I, also, I mean, I teach. I teach undergraduates. And, of course, they're a bit older. Um, but they're 17 when I start talking to them. Um, and you know, 21 when they leave. And you can kind of see in a 17-year-old what they were like a couple of years ago. Um, and I do sometimes go into schools and talk to people. Smelly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I feel... I don't know, the same way when I was writing Night Raking, the fact that there were not very, very real toddlers in contemporary fiction. I think certainly contemporary adult fiction is not serving teenagers very well. And I think so much of what we read about teenagers has them as these kind of lump and sullen people who aren't engaged and particularly teenage girls are only really interested in shopping and boys and hair and that is so much not my experience of that generation in in any way and i think sometimes it's easy it's easy to mock teenagers partly because of what we've done to their future and if we think that the 15 year olds are in fact intelligent engaged angry citizens who can see exactly what's going on in the world and don't like it and can't vote that feels a bit different from just thinking, oh well, you know, they're just silly little teenagers who are always on their phones and worrying about what the latest fashion in tights might mm. be. But I, I know lots of, you know, lots of 17, 18, 19 year olds who are every bit as politically switched on as their, their professors, and in many ways more so. Mm. You are writing this as a, as a man. Yeah. How, how, how is that? It was fine, it's not very difficult. <laughs> did I say things like, make him simpler? <laughs> yeah. you, you know you said things like that. I did, simpler. yeah. Sometimes I did, reckon simpler. Um, I, said, I do remember once or twice saying, I think around about now, he might think about his penis. <laughs> <laughs> and I inserted a penis thought. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, can I read another bit from your blog? Or do you like to read it? Which bit is it? It's brilliant. Yeah, there's no one from Warwick here. Yeah. No way. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it all before, it's okay. Well, he won't mind. He won't mind. <laughs> Someone, another writer who wanted me to do something for which he thought himself too busy, recently said, goodness me, you are prolific. Is that how he speaks? 
Because this made your offer a great I was perhaps unreasonably annoyed. He sounded like the Lord of the Manor talking about effectlessly fertile peasants. Male poets do sometimes have that air if they speak of female novelists. I came home and expressed my view, perhaps at some length, and was reminded that I published eight books in the last seven years, and that however irritating the conversation might have been, that is quite a lot. Yes, I said, but one of those books is co-authored, one of them is very short, and one is an academic monograph. And anyway, the point is that prolific makes it sound easy, as if I just fart and another book comes out. <laughs> now, compared to almost every other one, that's writing like a bloke, Sarah. Brilliant. <laughs> it's just ghosted. Now, <laughs> compared to almost every other way of making a living, there's a sense in which writing books is easy. You can do it in cafes while sipping something nice, at home wearing pyjamas with a cat on your lap, in a beautiful old library where silence is the rule and no one's allowed to bother you. You can stop at any moment to go for a walk in the sunshine or get your hair cut and nip around the shops like that. This is not nursing or mining or primary school teaching. It's not general practice or banking. There are no hours, no dress code and no line managers. I'm not suggesting that in those terms writing, or for the matter of that most other creative practices, are hard work. Writing may not be hard work, but it is difficult work.